A very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Cristina Garzillo, and I'm moderating this session on the new European Bauhaus and adaptive reuse of cultural heritage. Most of us know it, the new European Bauhaus is about creating beautiful, sustainable, and inclusive places, products, and ways of living. In the historical Bauhaus, the experiences of World War I motivated the architects and the planners to radically rethink life, society, and the everyday world, as nowadays the pandemics and the consequences of climate change and environmental pressures are shaping an era, we could say, of accelerated change. Transdisciplinarity, teamwork, cooperation between teachers and students, a kind of learning of doing approach and experimentation were very much needed at the time of Gropius and are very much needed today to face the rapidly changing society. Now we have so-called conversations. In the past, we had the Bauhaus Bucher. The recently adopted new European Bauhaus communication highlights that cultural, natural, and social assets make place unique and are actually opportunities for connection and social interaction and a kind of binding element that creates a sense of belonging. Adaptive reuse of cultural heritage is key in this perspective. We need to reconnect our built environment with nature through a kind of life-centered perspective, but we also need a human-centered paradigm to reconnect human beings with each other and also with the future generations. Now, interpreting adaptive reuse in this double perspective means to reconnect cultural heritage in the space, what we call the place-based approach, and in time. Instead of demolishing and rebuilding, adaptive reuse of unused heritage can bring kind of economic and social dynamics to the cities while um, reducing unsustainable urban sprawl, raw material and energy consumption, as well, of course, waste production. And this supports also um, synergistics models of business, finance and governance. What is really important is that the approach needs to go beyond the single building, architectural and technical matters to encompass circular, environmental, cultural, social and economic consideration about cultural heritage sites and their settings. Now, questions, shouldn't the places, the spaces, the buildings and the sites come from what the users actually want? Or should we create the space, adapt the building and the site and put a kind of label on them and say, go here to exchange, please. Now, the tendency is, of course, to suggest the first answer in which projects are processes to capture emotions, surprise, harmony, to regenerate trust and inclusion. This session today will shed light on the new European Bauhaus initiative and will analyze how adaptive reuse has a central role in creating a new cultural framework. You will hear the perspective of city representatives, researchers, grassroots activists, and the European Commission. I would like to dive straight in and introduce our first distinguished speaker, Ms. Borislava Woodford. Borislava is a policy analyst at the New European Bauhaus Initiative team run under the president of the European Commission. And she has over 12 years of experience in the field of youth structural and investment funds in several different units of the Commission's DG rebuild. And we are meeting quite regularly for the workshops to advance the NEV community and the lab. Borislava, thanks a lot for being with us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Christina. You've had such a wonderful, comprehensive introduction of uh, our initiative that uh, I wonder if I can capture your attention. I have prepared a dozen slides this morning. If I can have the slides online, please. Um, and I hope that this is just the starting point of a conversation. I would uh, answer your questions as to how to get in touch and involved with us at the end of the session. But for the time being, please bear with me 
it is really a little bit of a state of play of where our team stands, how we started uh, almost a year ago, uh, how it all came about. Uh, and where we wish to go and what we're doing right now. So my name is Borislava Woodford. I joined the Joint Research Center uh, on January 1st to work in this unique team, trying to mobilize people behind the new European Bauhaus Initiative. Obviously, it is based on the historical movement of 100 years ago, but we want to uh, frame it within the so-called Green, Green Deal um, frame that the Commission services are currently running and give it a cultural and more aesthetic type of um, uh, angle. So uh, sustainability and, uh, and togetherness, uh, inclusiveness, these are elements that bring a bell across uh, the board. But what we are bringing in is this additional cultural angle and I hope that uh, within your three days of Cities Forum, you would explore culture, heritage, mobility, but also uh, urban sustainability. These are core elements that ring a bell for us as a team that are trying to mobilize people behind the initiative. But you also recognize yourselves in, in what we've been trying to do so far. So let me start with slide number one. This is our European Bauhaus timeline. We started as a small team and tried to open, first of all, in January, a website and then invite people, entities, organizations, uh, um, public authorities, businesses to contribute to what we called the harvesting period or the, the sense making period of about six months. So until more or less end of June, uh, our tool, which was just an open website, was collecting contributions of how people would wish to see our time, our um, initiative evolve. That they, they they were open to to put whatever they want as inputs to try us to to tell us uh, what they would most want to see if we are to come up with a policy document or make sense of what was coming through the contributions of course people were living in lockdowns and uh, uh, what you see later on i'll briefly touch on what uh, we made sense of would resonate with a lot of people who lived in urban areas and were craving for 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 culture for sustainability for green spaces for connecting to communities um, the culmination for us was in september again of this year mid-september where we were mentioned for the second time in the state of the union speech of our president von der Leyen. she mentioned us because on the same day we had adopted an important policy document i talk about it later on but we also awarded our first winners of the new european Bauhaus edition number one uh, prices uh, there is a slide on that and what we're currently working on in the delivery place in the delivery phase of our initiative is a uh, preparation on what we want to um, see as a, as a living lab so a new european Bauhaus lab and also trying to open and uh, guide people through the various goals that we've been envisaged for in terms of funding. Um, this slide number two really gives us um, um, an emblematic um, way of uh, us trying to create a movement in six months, which was which was extraordinary because we received so many contributions over two thousand and. Uh, individual inputs but also um, high level people put their papers uh, we had uh, a growing community of official partners in the meantime it grew so much that we are now at <laughs> 313 official entities ICLE is one of, of our official partners I'm very pleased that you invited us to, to, to pitch to your audience today but I also invite New organizations who want to join us, we have a wide spectrum of, uh, of areas, sectors that we cover. You see a lot of our partners come from research and education. They are obviously faculties of architectural design in, in European uh, universities, but not only. We have art and culture, about 23 I see on our slide. Uh, come directly from art and culture. We have uh, heritage and built environment type uh, of um, uh, entities. We accept we accept everyone who is not for profit and uh, does not have political links. So it could be a very small green NGO to a very big uh, European foundation. 
more on how to become a partner is on our website. Um, in terms of communication media channel, ch channels, we use Instagram, Twitter, website. Of course, website hit, gets hits every every day. Um, what's surprising to us is we launched a newsletter and we already have over 24,000 subscribers. You can become one of those. Just put your name on our website. Our Instagram follows uh, followers uh, over 15,000. So this is a massive amount of people who want to, to hear from us. They probably like our pictures, but uh, not only. Uh, we try to uh, be active on social media and reach out especially to young people. In uh, year one, we managed within uh, six months or so to launch uh, the new European Bar House edition number one of our prizes. So we gave 10 awards in two different strands, 20 winners in total. The first strand you see briefly is called the European Bar House Awards, but this is really for uh, existing projects. Uh, and they were completed projects, we awarded them. And the new European Bar House Rising Stars were really concepts and ideas that we welcome from very young people. They needed to be under 30 of age, 30 years of age. And uh, we closed uh, the call uh, on, on, Janu on June 1st. The award ceremony was a success. I have a slide on it. But just to say that we plan to have a new edition of prizes. So watch out. Be um, interested to follow what's going on on our website because if we um, make sure we stick to to our own deadlines in january there will be a new edition with new categories and new new strands uh, this is what came through in terms of uh, projects that we awarded as as best uh, finalists i mean okay you see we picked a bit of a, a circular building industry type of uh, um, project on the left hand side or something to do with neighborhood uh, urban renaturalization re or if contemporary art as a tool um, reimagining our cities uh, as an extension of, of nature that also rings a bell to a lot of you but also we had uh, funky projects in circular supply chain for furniture for example this is just what our media team chose to to demonstrate on one slide the ceremony was a success very young people came to brussels 60 of them in fact 60 finalists they didn't know who is winning until the very end so suspense was there and it was a genuinely nice ceremony uh people love to be back together it was uh, in in person and a lot of people also follow followed us online and we want to repeat it next year so stay tuned now the next bit is the the i guess the a more mundane element of what we do. We needed to go through uh, the, no the motion of how commission comes about with a proposal. So we have a communication adopted in mid-September. It's our policy document. It's really a guiding uh, document. Uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, in terms of what came through the six months of harvesting, what people wanted us to um, concentrate and focus on was uh, a couple, well, there were four thematic axes. People wanted to see a transformation in uh, projects that reconnect people with nature, communities with nature. As I said, it was during lockdown, so it's not surprising. People were craving for, for green and sustainable and local. They wanted to gain a sense of community, to go back to belonging to a community. And they asked us to prioritize the places and people that need it most. This is not uh, um, uh, an evident type of uh, finding. You know, this is the first time commission is asked to not uh, go all over the place with uh, super duper uh, documents or uh, frameworks uh, at European level, but to really go local, grassroots, neighborhood, uh, think of places and people that need it most, especially after pandemic times. And of course, the fourth element is all about circular economy. So we want to see long term life cycle thinking and rethinking the industrial system, how we build, what we build, do we need to build all these questions. Up the next slide. It's taking time, I'm sorry. Normally I should have a, a good internet. Um, the next slide. Ah.
I'm sorry, I don't know what happened, but okay. Uh, the next slide is with us. So we're looking into developing a, a lab. So it's a community of uh, of partners, but also high level uh, roundtable personalities that are active in the Bauhaus movement. Uh, we wish to invite experts in specific fields to the lab and work on on deliverable so we want to have a commission-led agenda but also community-led agenda so you if you're an official partner can actually contribute to what we're trying to do we need to explore laboring strategies and links with funding so obviously we're not just talking for the sake of talking having a narrative we we want tangible results so we want also innovative type of funding coming behind the initiative like crowdfunding or or, or uh, philanthropy money etc we need to also uh, look at on places of knowledge and education. A lot of our partners are interested there anyhow. And we will have a, a, a festival next, next year in June, which would be in the form of Forum, Fest and Fair. I uh, see that I'm um, asked to speed up. We, we obviously work uh, with a rich policy of ecosystem. You know, there's a plethora of uh, initiatives, documents that the commission has produced for you, you would notice the new European agenda for culture or the European framework for action uh, of, on cultural heritage. These are documents that we build on. We don't want to reinvent uh, places. We want to, to obviously uh, pull uh, resources and, and figure out what's in all these policy documents that the Commission is trying to um, push forward and, and make sense of it through the triangle of sustainability, aesthetics and inclusion. Um, for the very, uh, oops, my slides are again not so quick to change. Um, for those of you who are interested, read our policy document. I mean, it will take you to um, in new meanings, enabling ecosystems, uh, you know, the, the way we want to transform by using some funds. We want to have a transformation of places, uh, some demonstrator type of documents, uh, demonstrator type of projects, um, and uh, have also very small initiatives that talk to, to local people. So not just grandiose type of uh, uh, built uh, um, or rebuild uh, structures or buildings, but go small, support small-scale projects. We are also thinking of an off-the-shelf uh, uh, instruments, which would be um, for financial instruments, so trying to combine public with, uh, with private funding. And uh, I'm not sure I have not been able to go through my slides, but I do not want to take uh, longer than what I was allowed, 10 yeah. minutes. So maybe best uh, the starting point for you would be uh, our uh, website. You just type New European Bauhaus Initiative, look at the delivery page, look at our welcome page, the partners page, and even uh, beyond uh, go and explore prizes edition number one and future prizes in 2022. Back to you, Christina. I'm sorry for, for the technical hiccup. No, thanks a lot, uh, Borisa, for this uh, very clear and also helpful overview of where we stand with uh, this initiative. I know that you need to lead, but just to confirm, is there still the chance for new stakeholders to, to get involved in the community? Yes, indeed. I did point uh, to a few possible entries. If you're an individual, you just want to stay in touch, know what we're developing, what we plan to launch as a call, etc. Stay tuned by subscribing to our newsletter. It's very simple. You do that. If you wish, as an entity, no matter the size, apply uh, as an official partner. There is also a very short survey you complete. you find it on the partners page. If you wish uh, to explore uh, um, a topic of interest to you, you can always find a local partner from the very large community of partners and introduce it as a topic for our future policy lab. We would try to accommodate as many topics as, as, as we can and make them relevant to the policy document, but also relevant to the growing community. Um, we are also thinking of how to involve businesses in the whole process, and we wish to give them the roles of hosts and sponsors, namely for showcasing projects during our future festival in June of 2020. So this is where I plead with you, figure out uh, 
we will announce the dates very soon. It will be an event that will take two to four days, and there will be obviously a fun and a forum and a festival part taking place in Brussels. But through the replication of our own partners, we would wish to see um, um, satellite events organized in member states that are interested in the initiative and that have the, the capacity to do something for us publicity-wise. So this is my uh, answer, Christina. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And it, it is clear that we are kind of performing an experiment and so we can come um, across something which is actually unforeseen and think about different issues that were a bit unknown to us. Thanks a lot, Borislava. And I would like now to turn to our next speaker, Yermina um, Stanoyev. Yermina is a postdoctoral researcher at Uppsala University and policy analyst in the field of culture-led, innovation-driven regional development and sustainable growth, smart specialization and new uh, policies. And she is involved, uh, and she was involved in the Horizon 2020 project named CLIC, which is actually the sister project of Open Heritage, uh, and has extensive experience with working with the European Commission, UNESCO, and other international and national institutions. Uh, Yermina, from your experience in the Horizon 2020 CLIC project, how is actually adaptive reuse of cultural heritage in line with the new European Bauhaus initiative? Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Christina, for, for giving me the floor. Um, I will be very happy to, to put this link um, and explain the, what in practice and in, in academia and theory also a click brought to, to this um, topic. So for, the, for those of you who are not familiar, CLIC is a project about circular models, leveraging investment in culture, heritage, adaptive reuse. And CLIC was one of the first projects, Horizon um, 2020 projects to actually put uh, the link of circular economy with the culture, heritage, adaptive uh, reuse and vice versa to really uh, make this link tangible, measurable and understandable um, as much as for wider audience, but also for the sector itself. Um, I would just like to point out that really uh, work that has been done in CLIC, it's a, it's a collective effort um, of a partnership of 16 organizations led by Institute for Research and Services for Development from Italy and um, 16 organizations from 10 countries uh, together with four uh, pilot cases that I will be exp explaining later how we worked on adaptive reuse um, of culture heritage. Um, just to give you a bit of a timeline, um, CLIC has uh, started end of 2018, beginning of 2019. Um, also, it was run throughout the, the pandemic uh, and the new European Bauhaus has been launched in the meantime. Uh, we were actually very pleased to understand that CLIC principles and what CLIC has been developing, uh, which was also uh, the, this idea of um, culture heritage adaptive reuse in a more human perspective. also taking into consideration different uh, social, cultural, but also economic and environmental aspects um, and, and impacts, but also the evaluation. So we understood that actually CLIC is contributing to the new European Bauhaus that has been um, actually identified at a bit later stage um, of, of CLIC. Um, and, and here it says, I would just like to quote that this new, as it was mentioned in the previous um, presentation, the new European Bauhaus wants to make uh, the Green Deal a cultural, human-centered and positive, tangible experience. And that's actually what CLIC uh, was trying to do uh, through, through different um, aspects. And um, exactly what I was saying, um, and I want to quote um, the new circular economy action plan that says less waste, more value. Uh, but CLIC has tried to do that through different um, aspects. So the culture aspect was really to enlarge the circular economy concept from waste and energy sector to the culture and heritage sector. Culture heritage is a driver of relationship, trust, cooperative capacity. And then also um, economic aspect, environmental aspect, circular governance aspect. But I would like to mention this, uh, what we have identified as 
from best practices to better projects. And um, I think that was really uh, the idea to work not only with uh, communities, to, but to have this human and people-centered approach, uh, which Click brought uh, in, in different perspectives and in different um, directions. So what you see here is really making circularity work for people, regions and cities, for communities, uh, for grassroots organizations, and um, all the seems complex, uh, but principles that Click brought were really to prolong the use value of resources and had these, we call them like three models, autopoietic model, generative model, and symbiotic uh, model that was really about place-based, about positive impact, the sales sustainability. It was human-centered and no waste of resources, and also uh, compatibility of new uses with the intrinsic value of culture heritage. So, of course, uh, that we were paying attention a lot on on intrinsic values of culture heritage but we were also working on the other side giving new functions beyond tourism and residential functions and we're working on developing new business models and bringing in new stakeholders who could contribute to this process from the business perspective and from the management uh, perspective of culture heritage and adaptive reuse so just to explain how in practice we have done this. So beyond the, the scientific uh, excellence that the CLIC brought and um, really the um, evaluation framework of culture heritage adaptive reuse within the circularity uh, perspective, uh, we have implemented um, a so-called heritage innovation partnership process and that has been led uh, by Eclay and, and their methodology, uh, but we have been working in, in so-called pairs of four pilot um, cases with their um, academic partners. And this process is something that was really uh, unique. Um, it was a unique approach to, to address um, adaptive reuse of culture heritage in a circular way, and it brought number of um, non-usual, non-usual suspect stakeholders to develop a common um, so-called local action plan. Uh, what was Christina mentioning at the beginning, do we bring, uh, do we make an adaptive reuse and then just give a function or we really try to uh, bring in more stakeholders? Well, that's what Click was doing. Well, Click was really trying to engage a large number of stakeholders in um, creating this local action plan. So the, the Heritage Innovation Partnership was really advocates uh, for shared and a circular governance model for cultural heritage. And it's, it, it's an important element in the journey uh, towards the creation of the local action plans for adaptive reuse of cultural heritage. The uh, local action plan for adaptive reuse is the result of the co-creation process, but also helps uh, to build um, support and uh, to implement circular adaptive reuse of culture heritage at the subnational level. Um, so, what is important for you to understand, we have been working uh, here with four pilots, and they were very different in their scale, in their challenges, um, in the way they approached this topic of culture heritage, adaptive reuse, and, and circularity. So, we have been working from a uh, regional level on the case of Vasariotalan. Uh, region in in Sweden to uh, city of Rijeka, city. Um, of uh, Salerno, but also uh, Parkhouse of uh, from from uh, Amsterdam. So here we have, um, and I'll just briefly um, give you uh, an overview of how we have been working and board what their local action plans of adaptive reuse has uh, brought. Um, here, I think we had very challenging situation working at the regional level with five municipalities that are also quite distant and, and small uh, municipalities. As you can see in my slide, we are talking about, um, for example, Fengefors with uh, 500, around 500 inhabitants and 100 uh, registered companies that are mainly companies related to arts and crafts. Um, and um, they are using the community that's actually the community itself, not quite. Um, that is placed in um, an old uh, paper mill. And we have been working specifically on this uh, case uh, when it comes to adaptive reuse. There was a set of different activities um, and actions, but when it comes to the regional level, um, and we have been working with the regional authorities of uh, culture for culture heritage, 
um, of, of um, region. Um, so what the local action plan has brought was really cultural natural heritage integration in regional policies. As you know, uh, regional policies in Sweden are pretty uh, strong and um, there are many other regional documents and policies that were pretty much developed uh, related to circularity, related to natural um, aspect. But here with the local action plan, we have tried to in integrate culture and natural heritage in these regional policies. Um, so the region also acted and the plan itself, um, local action plan later as a catalyst in place making in regional uh, development. And here we also had the case of use of embedded energy reuse as a part of um, circular economy. And that was, uh, let's say, one of the biggest challenges for the region to communicate with their uh, colleagues in other uh, fields to uh, implement uh, culture heritage adaptive reuse a, as part of the of the circularity process um, then we also had um, city of reka as one of our pilot cases and also partners and we were well lucky but also it was uh, challenging to have reka on board exactly in their period of uh, being european capital of culture which brought in itself additional challenges, but also many other uh, really relevant and, and great elements. But here we were focusing on adaptive reuse of several uh, different culture heritage uh, buildings, but also assets. As you can see, we have been working with a boat, Gallup uh, boat. And uh, what was interesting uh, really in Rijeka with the local action plan, uh, we brought a new value to the industrial heritage, a micro community led projects, um, a response to urban deficits in, in art and, and culture. Um, here you also see the building of um, one of the seats of, a, uh, of the ECOC um, that has been um, transformed um, and, and and reuse as well as some some other buildings that were in in this process so in city of rieka we have been working at the um, level of city also trying to identify cultural corridors and how to uh, really define the the, the city um, as a as a playground of, of the of circularity uh, processes with really um, different cultural activity experimentation and, and flexible uh, users um, similarly, but completely different, uh, uh, but similar in, in terms of the scale, we have been working with city um, of uh, Salerno, uh, where the focus was really on, for example, green procurements, culture creative industries, business innovations. Again, uh, we have uh, had several buildings or uh, spaces like uh, Giardini della Minerva, Palazzo Innovazione that were actively participating in this process and in the local action plan um, uh, there was really this cross-cutting vision for a Salerno circular city and how to bring a heritage uh, projects to be really funded, how to, to uh, link these adaptive reuse uh, with new financial models and instruments to bring them uh, to life. Um, also, uh, we, were, we, were, we have been working on the focus and focused on the regulation uh, for shared management of culture heritage as a common good. And um, uh, last but definitely not least, and it, it, it was pretty different than um, previous three uh, cases is the foundation Park House de Zweiger, always difficult to pronounce, uh, but it, what was their unique uh, feature in the project, but I would say also in the Amsterdam um, city, they act themselves as urban area attractor. They really work with a large number of stakeholders to bring uh, the topic of uh, circularity, the topic um, of sustainability, uh, really on another scale, working with grassroots organizations, but on the other side, also working with the city, Amsterdam uh, Circular City. So, for example, uh, one of the areas uh, their local action plan has been developed was really new circular governance and business model because they were also very hit by, by COVID pandemic. And it has been a circular heritage included in the Amsterdam official circular city uh, strategy. 
technology. So um, their role was really uh, live events, uh, live cast, uh, working on uh, private public partnership with social purpose. And um, here I will be just uh, closing and, uh, and and staying, of course, for, for further questions. Uh, I, I hope you managed to get really the comprehensiveness of um, the click um, aspects of working on different levels on the culture, heritage, adaptive reuse and uh, circularity processes. Thank you, Christina. Thanks, Back to you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Irmina. It was um, very inspiring. And um, I think that these, uh, in these four cases, we really understand how the adaptive reuse is expressed actually through these continuous adjustments and adaptation over the time to meet different needs of the different contexts. Uh, I would like now um, to link actually these four city cases moving um, towards other uh, city cases and to the ones that now we have selected for this session. And um, the first uh, um, concerns Vittoria Gastes, which is actually the largest municipality in the Basque country and now is in the process of revising the urban master plan. Um, and before, uh, let's say, introducing the speaker for Spain, let's have a look at a short video to immerse ourselves in Victoria's life. Now I can better introduce Beatriz Garcia Monco Pinero. Beatriz has a master in restoration, rehabilitation, built heritage and landscape management from the University of the Basque Country in Spain. In 2015, she began to work as an architect in the city council in the urban landscape department and for the city planning department. And currently she works as a member of the sustainability climate and energy team. Beatriz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for your kind presentation. Uh, first, I, I would like to thank uh, Open Heritage, uh, Green Charts, iClay and Civitas for inviting my city, Victoria Castells and me to uh, do this presentation. And, and of course, all of you uh, for attending it. As uh, Christina said before, we are uh, located, Victoria Castells is located in the north of Spain. It is uh, the largest uh, city in the Basque Country, with 200, nearly 215 or 60,000 inhabitants. And uh, we are very proud uh, for being the only green, uh, European green capital in the, uh, in the country, in Spain. And we also won uh, the Global Green City Award in 2019 so we think we are uh, a very green city and we are uh, very proud of it and uh, for now for this uh, interesting uh, meeting i prepare a presentation about what uh, what i think is an adaptive, adaptive uh, reuse of our heritage i prepare a presentation i hope you can see it uh, right i have um, uh, a presentation about uh, Vitoria Gasteiz's historical uh, neighborhood or historic uh, quarter retrofitting. As uh, you can see um, here in this slide, these are uh, 10 of uh, Vitoria Gasteiz's neighborhoods. These are uh, what we, well, we call them um, our gold neighborhoods. 
and we are now developing a master plan uh, of the co-rehabilitation and revitalization of all 10 of them. But today I'm going to focus on the historic quarter, what we call uh, La Almendra. Uh, for this plan, which, is, uh, which I also think is very interesting, uh, is that we have made a social and urban studies for each one of them. So we can identify the problems and the challenges that they have in all the states. I mean, in, in social, uh, social problems, environmental problems, and economic problems. Um, uh, with that, we have a lot of information, a lot of very interesting information to make them this, this plan. So here, this is how it looks like. This is how our historical quarter uh, looks like today. And as you can see, I hope you can see it, it is shaped in the shape of, of an almond. And that is why we know it as the medieval almond, so la almendra. Uh, it is located in the center of the city, of course, and the main problems and challenges of this neighborhood uh, in resume, and these problems and challenges, we find them in these uh, social uh, and urban studies that we uh, have made, are mobility problems. Mobility problems are mainly because of the narrowness of the streets, uh, then uh, uh, and a very, very big noise problem because it is one of the main nightlife areas in the city. Uh, and then, uh, socially, we have a, an aging population and also a very diverse uh, population with a lot uh, with immigrants and minorities that uh, live there. And all of them, or most, uh, most of them, with few economic uh, resources. And finally, of course, uh, an old building stock with a structural humidity and isolation problems, just to name a few. So, what we want to do with this historic neighborhood? Well, we plan for, in, in the short term, we plan 24 actions for the next 12 months. Uh, same, uh, some of them have already started and so others will be developed next, next year. As you can see, there are 24. I am not going to, uh, to read all of them because I don't have time. And I think you will also uh, have this presentation uh, available. So I am going to focus on these three ones. I hope you can see them. Um, yes. Uh, so, uh, all of the actions that I've, I've talked uh, before, or you, you saw before, the 24 of them, um, must be integrated in a urban uh, regeneration strategy. Uh, and for that, we developed it. Uh, we, uh, we will place uh, actions on the short and the medium term. For example, uh, I, I hope you can see it. We have uh, on the down uh, right side of the slide, you have a, a little drawing of a delivery logistics uh, center that we uh, want to build inside the uh, historic quarter. Uh, and this center will supply goods to the, to the neighborhoods. Um, we also want to release soil on plots with out of order buildings. Out of order buildings are buildings that are not uh, accord with our city master plan now. And uh, in this plus, we want to build new residential buildings. And also we want to allow the possibility of an underground parking. These are things that will be uh, inside of our new uh, urban city master plan. We also want to regenerate uh, two streets uh, that have today buildings from the 40s and the 50s with a certain level of depredation. Uh, we also want the, re the redensification of certain buildings, not all of, uh, on all of the neighborhoods because that's not possible. Uh, we also, of course, will do energy efficiency restoration and we want to recovery the recovery of historic buildings. 
which as you can uh, imagine in the city center and in the old uh, historic, sorry, the historic uh, quarter, there will be a lot. Uh, also, and this is a, a very interesting, uh, interesting part of the plan, we are going to create a low emission zone in the framework of developing superblocks. We have a superblock policy here in the city. We have one already built and we are planning on another two. So this will uh, be another one of them. So the number three, I hope. Uh, in this one, we want to um, increase clean mobility or climate neutral mobility and the decrease of uh, mobility in motorized uh, modes. Uh, of course, that will uh, improve our air quality. Uh, we, will, uh, we will have a, a, a noise reduction. Uh, and as you can see in this slide, you have the first and the second phase. In the first phase, we're planning to, to create uh, a zone, uh, a zone or an, an area without uh, any uh, mobilized uh, vehicles. So it will only be a pedestrian, uh, a pedestrian part of the of the quarter. And in the second slide, we are uh, developing a, a second circle. I will say a second circle with uh, where we um, will uh, rethink the traffic direction. So we'll um, put together uh, a very, a very slow uh, city there with uh, the traffic, uh, with a street with only one direction uh, traffic. And then in the, in the third phase, as you can see in the slide, we will uh, redevelop uh, and rethink all the, all the traffic and the mobility inside inside this this neighborhood uh, uh, also we will uh, installate uh, cameras uh, as access control systems uh, depending on car type emissions and we will limit the access control so only residents uh, uh, who ride a car uh, can ride a car within the limits uh, established um, and uh, also we have here um, an increasing uh, greenness and biodiversity. Here we have uh, some projects. Uh, there are different projects. We have a naturalization of spaces. And this naturalization and also a renovation of empty plots as, as part of our green urban infra infrastructure, which is a very important uh, matter for our city and uh, for the design of these uh, new spaces we uh, want or we uh, also did uh, uh, it's very important for us the implication of our citizens uh, to, uh, for the design of these spaces but also to uh, give them um, as Christina said before I think uh, a sense of belonging to this, that they think that this is their space, that they build it, they design it, that this is, is theirs. So, and also uh, we want to, uh, to natural, we have another project with, which I think is very interesting, is the naturalization of schoolyards. We have these projects for all of our city, um, but also here in the uh, medieval quarter, because we have schools here and we want, because we have nearly 80% of our schoolyards are not naturalized, naturalized. So we think it's a, a, very, um, a, a very important thing to do. And most these days with the pandemic and, and all of this matter. And uh, this, is, this is all, I hope I am uh, in time. So thank you very much, Christina. Thank you very much, everyone who attended the meeting. And of course, I am available for any questions and I will gladly answer in the matter that I can. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks, Beatriz. I think that here it was really clear how the rehabilitation of the old medieval areas together with the improvement of the public space and the mo mobility while at the same time 
maintaining the identity is also, I would say, perfectly in line with what Borislava was referring to this morning, uh, the thematic axis of the transformative path of the new European Bauhaus. So uh, the reconnecting with nature, the regaining a sense of belonging, the prioritizing the place and the people that need it most, and so on. Uh, yeah, please uh, stay with us until the end. Thanks again. Uh, but now I would like to move uh, on to the next city. And uh, I would actually like to hear about how Venice foresees future, which is indeed the title of our next presentation. The speaker is Jacopo Galli. Jacopo obtained his PhD from uh, the U of University in Venice, and he was among the curators of international exhibitions, such as the Biennale of Venice, the Triennale of Milan, and among the founders of a urbicide task force, a multidisciplinary think tank on architectural and urban reconstruction strategies. So, Jacopo, how is actually Venice called once more to innovate itself, and how can you make this Slogan, the form follows the planet operation. I hand over Christ to you. Christina, thank you very much. I hope uh, that uh, everything is fine. And uh, I thank you a lot for the invitation and for the presentation I've been following. I'll be trying to, to answer to your question uh, with a brief, uh, with a brief uh, presentation. Please let me know if you can see it. And... Uh, Yes, uh, Venice uh, today is uh, a measure of the problems and a model uh, for the solutions towards uh, the construction of a global future capable of combining sustainability and beauty. The, the city where we, live, where we live is exists only thanks to intervention of strategic planning, continuous care and administrative courage that can guarantee the survival of the settlement and of its environment. And, this permanent risk condition that we live in Venice, and we have lived through its history, is today extended to the entire planet that is experiencing the first effects of climatic and environmental crisis that will radically alter lifestyles and societal models. So Venice today is called to once again carry out its historical function of a microcosm, a physical place where problems and solutions with a global scale and a long time frame are concentrated here and now. For this reason, we believe that the new European Bauhaus project and its slogan, Form Follows Planet, finds in Venice a perfect testing. Because Venice has always been a model in which issues such as social inclusion and environmental impact are conjugated in design systems that, on a small scale, prefigure and anticipate global changes. And so we made this new slogan, let's say, for our project, that is Venice foresees the planet, anticipates the planet. Following this slogan, we put together a group of partners capable of representing the different sources of the city, the uh, administration, the universities, private and public uh, partners. And uh, we initiated a wide set of global dialogues on the significance of the city of Venice and its value in the, in the current global dynamics and in the future. And these dialogues were aimed at the individuation of the topic that Venice was of the topics that Venice were able to foresee and that are still valuable for the definition of future design strategies. And I will briefly try to present these. And first and foremost, Venice has the ability to foresee the cyclical use of scarce resources. The Republic of Venice was funded by an intervention of humans who deliberately and paradoxically wanted to render habitable and a place out of the ordinary, usually not suitable to be populated. A sense of Vino will state a city founded on the impossible. The administration understood that some topics that were central in the survival of the Republic could not be entrusted to the political powers, but had to be managed by superior bodies called magistrature. The magistrature were capable of weighting the use of the territory in a sustainable way. Venice consequently guided political and economic choices, knowing how not to exceed the replication rates of its ecosystem. Uh, for example, and here you can see uh, an image, the management of uh, forests, of woods, that were central in the continuous construction of the city and the preservation of the lagoon system. 
is a um, is, is a great example of his use of uh, magistratura. The forests of the Dolomites were inaccessible to the public, and the rate of growth and cut was strictly controlled to maximize the production and avoid waste. The forests were subdivided in different types of trees and intended for different purposes. As an example, the Cancillo woods in the Dolomites were made to use for beech trees that were shaped to produce the ores of the Venetian galleys and are still known today as Foresta da Remo. Um, all the cutting techniques and pace of growth were carefully studied and planned to maximize production and stop the degradation of the soil and the waste of product. The preservation of the trees was strictly linked to the construction of the city, but can be defined as a forest of upside down trees. It's in, in reality, all the trees in the ground that allowed the original few islands to be compacted, defined and enlarged. The sum of the choices of geographical location, use of resources and development of technologies defined the construction of the city through the process of selection of materials, techniques, of urban types, and it's something that it's continu continuously mediated and negotiated with um, evolutionary social models. It's a complex process that dic dictates the construction of the urban space and transforms it, transforms it into another manageable resource for a process that is not generically organic, but it's guided by some sometimes hidden rules. In these examples that you can see, this, the shape of the city of Venice is defined by the firewalls perpendicular to the canals, and all the buildings can, uh, have to adjust and are attached and follow this common logic. It's a system of rules that does not lead to homogeneity or standardization, but rather builds a solid base for an infinite variable system where the firewalls become the true urban material of the city, generator of, of, of the urban intern identity and the true form factor of the city. Uh, the paradigm of the global risk society in which the horizon of fragility extends to the entire planet finds in Venice uh, an amphibian nature, uh, an important testing ground. So the, the other topic that I will briefly want to present is the ability of Venice to foresee adaptation, to uh, be the place of necessary adaptation. The city is the center of a very, very wide territory designed to guarantee its survival, the lagoon. It is a, an environment that must be conserved in its amphibian nature and um, somewhere halfway between water and land. To maintain and model such a particular environment, Italian engineers diverted rivers, dug canals, reinforced the strips of land that separate the lagoon from the sea, and in general, tried to maintain the artificial integrity of this amphibian system. And it's something that happened in history, but it's still happening today. And the term maintenance is reductive and does not fully describe the historical urban planning enterprise of the Venetians. Uh, the care of the vast uh, Venetian amphibian environment requires uh, still today persistent intervention, adaptation, and continuous planning. Uh, and, it, and it's something that goes from the large scale to the small scale. Well, private and public spaces, canals, bridges, wells, squares, streets uh, are all part of a common logic based on the adaptation to the difficult condition of the lagoon environment. Venice is in this sense a, a place of great contradiction. It's a city on water, but without any access to drinkable water and no natural springs. So the Venetians develop a system, a very refined system for the capturing of water, the Venetian well, that uh, represents a common shared property among the neighbors' houses, not necessarily a public service, but rather a system of joint ownership among groups that used the well and cared for its continuous maintenance. The lack of water, on one side is contrasted by its opposite, the periodical threat to the very existence of the city posed by high, high waters. And in this image, we can see what, what is known in Venice as Aqua Granda in the, the 4th of November, 1966. And it's the effect on the city on the record mark of 194 centimeters above the medium level that started a desperate global call for the safeguard of the city that will lead, for example, in its inclusion in the UNESCO World Heritage uh, list. But uh, the extraordinary high water that we experienced in our lives, the 13th of, of November of, two, of 2019, 
has a completely different image. It's this image of is almost joyful tourist that show the increasing difficulty of a city that is almost completely devoted to the tourist monoculture in facing the growing, the growing threats of climate change. To answer these problems of climate change, Venice is producing thoughts and projects, and one is this that is much debated, and it's the Mose barriers, and it's called to once again revolutionize its form while keeping faith with its nature. Fragility and risk have always been the main drivers of the Lagoon cities and its continuous renewal um, design of its continual rethinking. So, once again, uh, Venice anticipates the global challenges of tomorrow, the global the, the, of the whole planet, that involve updating the built environment and conserving historical settlements. In light of the necessary major modification of urban life that will be required globally in the near future due to climate change. The problem of the relationship between architecture, resources, water system, climate change becomes, becomes essential. And last but not least, Venice shows the theme of beauty as a founding quality. Venice directs beauty. Uh, Venice is the concrete demonstration that combining economy and quality of life, culture and technology was possible in the past and can still be possible in the future. From the object to the building, from the work of art to the urban space, from the product to the territory, each piece of Venice builds a profound and coherent dialogue with a virtuous wall. And in this sense, the words of a former professor of our University of U of the, the renowned, renowned philosopher Giorgio Gamben seem to define a possible path for the future. And he says that when megacities will die, a new municipal civilization will have to be thought of, defined by a balance between the local and the global economy. The history and physical reality of Venice could perhaps provide some indications. And here we stay, and uh, we hope that uh, this uh, does not remain only as a, as a phrase, but becomes something much more strategic. And uh, we'll hope to be able to test the capacity of Venice in the future very soon. In the framework on the new European by House Lighthouse Initiative, we will present an idea for the area of Santa Marta who, that will be the testing ground for new innovative ideas that can start from our campus, from our buildings, that we have numerous buildings in the area, and can perhaps attract a new population with advanced knowledge that can represent a credible alternative to the touristic monoculture, constructing also dialogues with the numerous globally renowned cultural institutions of the city in order to imagine new lifestyle and techniques capable of facing the increasing dangers of climate change. And here we can see the old front of the Judeca Canal. And the, the uh, ideas can potentially expand to a large portion of the uh, historical core in a vision that continuously learns from the past in order to continuously reshape, reimagine and reconstruct a future characterized by sustainability, inclusion and beauty. And so we look forward to discuss with these uh, ideas with the global community uh, and to discuss these issues that we think are very pressing in the near future. And uh, I warmly thank you for the invitation and for the support. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jacopo, for this kind of historical excursion and also to sh show us how I, the Venice can be a model in which such issues such as uh, social inclusion and environmental impact are uh, very strictly linked. And I understand that your areas of intervention is, are mainly based on those of uh, Santa Marta. So please stay with us. Thanks again. But I would like now to turn to collaborative spaces and introduce you to one of the 16 observatory cases of the Open Heritage Project and one of the winners of the New European Bauhaus Awards in the category of Regenerated Urban and Rural Spaces. The prizes, Boris Lava talked about it before, uh, went through, have gone through various selection processes, evaluation committees, juries of partners, and were launched as part of the co-design phase of the initiative and awarded in September. Now, La Fabrica de Toda la Vida is about an old cement factory in a rural municipality of Spain, which was abandoned for years, and now it's a collaborative space for free culture and a landmark 
for an open network of creators, thinkers, and social agents throughout the territory. Let's have a look at the video. This is La Fabrica, an open space for culture and ecological projects. More than 3,000 people collaborated in this duocracy, restoring the ruins of a factory out of recycled materials and keeping brutal culture So yeah, we are resisting. For 10 years, we've been sharing dreams and knowledge, recovering the polluted soil by planting gardens, celebrating events and giving artists a stage, producing music and artwork. You know sharing is caring and we care about our territory. Un espacio sostenible. Together, we work to shape our dreams. We are slowly setting up a sustainable place to live and to work in common. Are you coming? So we have here with us today as representative of La Fabrica de Toda la Vida, Helena Ortiz, uh, to give us more information on how the space was rehabilitated and how the surrounding community was involved. Helena, you are a cultural activator. Could you tell us a bit more uh, about the story of the factory? What happened since it was abandoned? Hi, Christina. Thank you very much. Um, the factory <clears throat> is located in southwest of Spain and it's located in a very rural region. So we say we are in the periphery of the periphery. We are really outside in the middle of nowhere in some sense. And in 2009, a group of young people decided to make that abandoned space uh, and to use it and turn it into, into their lab for creation. They had no idea of how far they, that would go. Um, nowadays, the main building of the factory is completely restored and we have five actri active processes. Um, those processes are programs that we, um, that we care about and they are an, a vegetable garden that is outside is called Siempre Viva and it takes care of the polluted soil that is outside. Uh, we have a lot of heavy metals disposals in the area so we are growing a vegetable and forest uh, to, to restore that soil. We also have a music studio to produce uh, music and artwork from people of the area a workshop that is called La Cacharreria, which is focused in reusing materials to create new ones, new uses, and also called learning how to reuse materials. And we also have Cine al Fresco, which is the oldest initiative of the factory. And it projects independent cinema outside the factory for free during the summer. And the very last project is not a physical project, it's called Autopias. And it's all about finding good strategies for good living and education around it. Yeah, th thank you. So you have indicated all the programs and activities that are currently in place. And what do you think could, is the role of the bottom-up initiatives in achieving the new European Bauhaus uh, vision? Okay, uh, Christina, I've been thinking about this a little bit because um, I don't feel really represented with this term of bottom-up initiatives and it's for a very simple reason. I think we, in La Fabrica, we are a community, but we don't share a vision of an up zone where we should go to or an upper 
institution or place where we should be at. So instead, what we feel we are doing is that we are growing a thicker and stronger bottom. And that is precisely what smaller initiatives should be doing in this new European Bauhaus movement, I believe. I, I'm, I'm going to explain myself. Um, I, think, I think it's really important that instead of adapting bottom initiatives towards more complex ways of organizing, um, we should instead um, we should instead bring those institutions closer to new ways of organizing ourselves and new ways of cooperations. We work small, we work by micro agreements, and I think that is the human perspective we are all talking about. We should take care of the human side of what we are doing. In that sense, Cristina, this is my truly a true answer to you. Um, I believe we are thinking only about reusing buildings, reusing structures, but we should also rethink and reuse the way we relate to each other. We should make hard collaborations, honest collaborations, where we can actually see ourselves as humans, individually and collectively. Um, no, thank, thanks a lot. I think this is uh, very, very clear. And would you say that this um, could be one of your learnings or the learnings that could be transferred to, to other authorities or other places in Europe and beyond Europe? Why not? Absolutely. Um, in fact, La Fabrica is a very small place in a very small village, but we are a very, very large network of creators um, throughout, the, throughout the national territory and also international territory. This has been made little by little with simple actions, simple movements, and very human-centered. Um, I believe we have a lot to share with institutions in terms of how to establish new communitarian ways of working and how to cooperate and make long-lasting cooperations. So in terms of um, the questions you just asked, I believe um, we have to reuse also the, the human knowledge we have uh, and focus it on creating and building the new spaces. Yes, okay, thanks a lot. I think this is uh, absolutely needed. Um, I, um, I, I thank you for, for your contribution and I, I would like now also to, looking at the time, to um, pull the thread of what has been said until now. And I also would like to um, all the speakers to join me again. And uh, while I see if there are any specific questions on the chat, um, I, uh, I can also, um, what I can say is that what struck me is that in all these examples, there was a lot of a compromise and mediation role that had a kind of a, a central focus and it has it was indeed in the school of design of Gropius in which artistic creativity architecture uh, designed was opened to engineering science business studies and uh, more uh, cooperation would you um, have have anything to to add on this maybe um, one of the speakers maybe Yermina well, I think nowadays with many programs that we have uh, to, to use, like uh, Horizon 2020 or now uh, Horizon Europe is coming, uh, we have a some, somehow a modern re reflection on that. If I just look into the, you know, clicks team, uh, we have been uh, working on the same uh, issue with environmentalists, with uh, social scientists, psychologists, people working on business, on management, on really business models. Um, so this idea of really gathering um, different profiles and different uh, professions uh, toward one same goal is really a name. 
And what Helena was also saying, I would I would put this, it's not um, reuse of buildings, but it's also reuse of skills, professions, capacities that we have as, as professionals, that as, as human beings. So in, in that regard, what we also have um, as programs, official programs offered by the European Commission or programs that we are creating ourselves, it's it's extremely important to work. We heard in the in the introductory session beyond silos. Um, and that's something uh, extremely important to tackle uh, topics like, like this one. Thank you. Yes, uh, I also um, saw from the various presentation that the aim is not only to protect it, the heritage, but also actually to promote a new uh, culture, which is in essential to improve this uh, human centered uh, and also ecological uh, paradigm and all these aspects assets, the arts, the local crafts, the know-how that are included. Uh, these are the real important uh, issues. And this, I saw it from the city's uh, presentation. And as well, that the creativity is not only related to the reuse of the architectural project, but also to the management. So it's a kind of creativity of the entrepreneur or of the manager who decides to undertake a certain investment and to run kind of relative uh, risks uh, by creating new uh, types of organizations. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, Jacopo or Beatriz want to add this very, very uh, shortly so that then we can close uh, the session. Uh, well, no, I, I don't think there's nothing to add to that. I think uh, that's our uh, all European uh, and all the world uh, city goal. It's it's a common uh, a common goal for all of us. And I think we are we are getting in the uh, start line there. So we have a lot of work to do ahead of us. And I hope with this exchange of experiences. And with this kind of, of events and workshops and uh, with all of that, we are uh, closer to, to getting there. Thank you. Jacopo, any final recommendation <laughs> words? No, it's, it, it has been a pleasure. It's, it's a pleasure to, to, to see what, what, what ideas have been, uh, have been developed. Um, I think that... Uh, uh, these, uh, these, the world has much changed uh, from the real Bauhaus. It's a completely different world. Uh, things uh, have got, uh, well, it seems to us more complicated, but they were coming out of uh, big troubles as well. So maybe it's only uh, a matter of how we see things. I think that one thing that remains, uh, and uh, it, it, it's, it's this phrase by, by, by Walter Gropius uh, that used to say that colorful is my favorite color. Uh, so this idea of uh, uh, many things, that many, many differences, uh, that differences is something to, to embrace, to, to appreciate. And so I think it, it was clear from today yeah. and uh, it makes me very happy. Thanks a lot. So thanks uh, um, a lot for all your contributions. We are now approaching the end. Actually, it's, it's the end of the session. And I would really like to thank you so much, both the speakers and the attendees. And maybe you would like now to join the networking carousel that will enable you to have kind of random one-to-one -one virtual meetups, sort of virtual speed dating. As soon as you enter the session, you will be randomly kind of matched up with another participant, and you will have five minutes to meet and exchange impressions. Um, after the lunch break, we will start discussing the future direction of sustainable mobility decision making in our cities. So thanks again from my side, all the best and goodbye. <laughs>